This podcast may not be suitable for young listeners. Steve Lilly, journal entry number 11. Leonard Cates was a son of a bitch. He had been all his life. When Leonard was seven, he robbed a lemonade stand with a knife in his hand. Throughout his primary years, he would shake down every kid in the neighborhood for lunch money, paper route money, and yard cutting money, money the other kids had earned in an honest way. Savings for bicycles and skateboards and even college tuition were emptied when Leonard went on his rampages through the streets. He was bigger and meaner than the rest of the kids. No one had the guts to stand up to him. The trick to saving money in the North Memphis neighborhood where Leonard prowled was not to have any money on you when he caught you. Leonard graduated from his minor thefts and shakedowns to bigger prey as he aged. He spent time in juvenile detention, but he was so mean as a teenager, the authorities would let him out early because he was beating the hell out of all the other kids in the facility. At 22, he robbed a convenience store on South Parkway. It was the 16th robbery in his life of crime. The clerk shot him as he was leaving the store with his pockets full of cash. The wound in his leg festered for three days. He should have had it treated, but he knew that gunshot wounds were reported to the cops, so he laid in his room suffering and hoping the half-inch round hole in his thigh would heal on its own. It only got worse, though. His stepmother found him unconscious, laying on blood-soaked sheets. She hadn't known he was even home. But on her once-a-year walk through the filthy house, she discovered her stepson alive, still breathing, but sick from a severe infection. She knew she had to call an ambulance, but she didn't need the heat showing up inside the home. The drug addicts don't like the cops in their houses. So she called a friend and both women pulled Leonard's unconscious 250-pound body outside that night. From there, they loaded him in the back of a van, and they drove him a few blocks from the house and pulled him out onto the sidewalk of another neighborhood. And then she stopped at a phone booth and called an ambulance. His stepmother would never see Leonard again. She overdosed three years into his 30-year prison term. His father never visited him in the joint. Leonard was granted parole when he had completed 20 years of his sentence. He discovered there were meaner and tougher dudes than him in the joint, and he kept his head down and followed the rules. He got out for good behavior, an accomplishment for Leonard Cates. Within two years, Leonard had a decent job and an average apartment and had met a woman who actually loved the unlovable. Marlene had grounded him, and Leonard was becoming a good citizen, despite the pull that lingered, calling him back into crime where the easy money lived. The opportunities and temptations, though, were around every corner, and it was hard on him not to rob a place or to break into some East Memphis home where the upper class live, but with pure discipline, he held his ground, and he kept working. He didn't want to lose his wife. Marlene was important to him, but the draw back into crime was stronger with each passing week. He didn't want to go back to prison either, but he felt himself giving in. He knew it was only a matter of time before he would be making that easy cash. It was natural to him, and he was following his instincts. He had to make sure not to get shot this time, though. On a summer afternoon after work, it was a Thursday, He drove and he looked at the parking lot of a liquor store that he had watched for weeks. Only one car was parked in front. It was too easy and he caved. It would be a quick job, in and out, and the couple would have money to do a little extra. He would knock off this one and see how he felt afterwards. So he parked his car on the side of the building so that the car wouldn't be seen by anyone inside. In the store, Leonard walked to the back shelves and wrapped his hand around the neck of a bottle of brown liquid that he had never heard of 
and then he reached into his back pocket to extract the ski mask that he would use to disguise his face, but it wasn't there. The snub nose 38 was in his waistband right behind the button on his jeans and covered with his shirt. He could feel the weight of it pressing against his belly. He argued with himself whether to go ahead with the stick up without the mask and then he thought better of it. After replacing the bottle to its shelf, he left the store and drove home. He could hit the store or any store next week. His patience and now mature criminal mind saved him that afternoon, but it would be more than that to completely change Leonard Cates. He entered their small apartment, depressed and out of sorts. For a moment, back in the liquor store, his adrenaline had peaked, anticipating the thrill of taking down the place. It had been 22 years since he felt that thrill. Coming off that sort of high was a letdown, without the memory of the robbery fresh in his mind to relive a few times through the coming days. And in his patience, he knew he had plenty of time to rob a place. He would look forward to that. That would have to do for now. Why do you look so sad? His wife said, and she kissed his cheek. Did you have a bad day at work? Leonard said nothing. He threw his jacket across the back of their sofa and then flopped down in it while kicking his size 13 boots up onto the coffee table. Boots off the table, mister, she said. Now supper's going to be ready in a few minutes. Go wash your hands. I have a surprise for you. Go on now. Leonard reluctantly lifted his frame from the couch and headed to the bathroom where he washed his hands and face and walked back into the small kitchen. The light wasn't on, and he wondered if the power had gone out. Rounding the corner, separating the living area from the small kitchen, he saw a table lit by two candles. And in the glow was his favorite meal, and a Pyrex dish, and that was surrounded with their best and only fake china from Walmart, silverware neatly arranged on napkins. His wife sat at the table, grinning. She had the best smile of any woman he had ever known, he thought and she beckoned him to sit with a gesture of her hand. What do you think? Are you hungry? She said. Leonard had never seen anything like this in his life. It had taken him two years of marriage to get used to a woman cooking for him. His life before had been junk food when he could get it, and then prison cuisine. Never meals cooked specifically for him. Well, this was out of his element. He had no idea how to react. What the hell's going on? He asked. It was his usual suspicious way of thinking and speaking. No one had ever treated him this way. No one had ever treated Leonard Cates like a human being. This is a special night, she said. Why don't we eat, and then I'll tell you the surprise in a minute. They ate the meal, and Leonard was full. Marlene sighed with impatience as he dug in for a second helping of lasagna. He had forgotten there was a surprise. When there was plenty of food available, you ate as much as you could get in your crawl. There were never guarantees when the next meal would happen. Old habits never die. Finally full, Leonard wiped his mouth and laid his napkin on the table, and all thoughts of the botched robbery had been stolen by his wife's kindness. He had forgotten the thrill and now looked at her in the glow of the candles. I know that we never talked about this and, well, it just happened. His wife looked down at her lap with a sinister grin. What happened? What are you talking about? You're going to be a father. The doctor told me today that I'm already three months along. The nurse even did an ultrasound and she thinks you're going to have a daughter. You're going to have a baby, he asked. We are having a baby, she said. Leonard Kate's life changed in that moment. Crime would never enter his mind again. He wasn't going back to prison. Nothing was going to screw this up. The chair hit the wall behind him because he had gotten up so fast. Marlene, startled by the noise, wondered if he was angry until he was on one knee next to her. Slowly, he lowered his head to her lap so that his ear was only a fraction of an inch of skin and flesh from his new daughter, and he whispered, 
You're what I've been waiting for all my life. Cates wasn't a son of a bitch anymore, and in an instant he transformed into the best husband and father the world had ever known. The trails at Fort Pillow State Park, north of Memphis, were not the most difficult to walk. Even with the added weight of full backpacks, they were still easy for the hikers who had hundreds of miles logged throughout the past three years. There were hills, but none that were longer than 50 yards or so. It would not give this pair of hikers the proper training they needed to be prepared for the Grand Canyon rim-to-rim hike only three months away but it was all that was available in their area, so they used the trails to train as often as they could. The Grand Canyon hike, dreamed up by 12-year-old Amanda Cates, started the previous year. She read a story about hikers who had accomplished the rim-to-rim hike in a magazine she found in the school library. After weeks of pestering her father about doing the hike, he finally made a few calls and found a guide service he could afford, and he booked the trip. The father-daughter hiking team already had the gear that they would need for the trip, with a few exceptions, so now the only thing they had to do was train. According to the outfitters, they both needed to be able to walk an incline for a mile without stopping. There were no hills like that close to where the hikers lived, so they joined a local gym and trained on treadmills. It wasn't perfect, but it worked. Leonard looked ahead and watched his daughter take on a Fort Pillow steep incline. Her tenacity was admirable. He thought back to the day that he walked into the liquor store and would have robbed the place had he not forgotten his mask, and he thanked the spirits for that error. Had he taken down the store, he would likely be in prison now, and he wouldn't be seeing this. Life had changed. A couple of lateral movements to other companies and a promotion or two and he was now in the middle class with a mortgage, a car for him and Marlene, and a daughter in a Memphis-area private prep school for girls. He was overstretched, but he just worked harder to give them the life that he wanted them to have, and Leonard spent every free minute with Amanda. He knew as she got into the teens, she would begin to pull away from Dad and Mom. Now was the time that he would have her attention. Now was the time to leave an indelible mark of a father on a daughter. He would keep her as far from the life he had grown up in as possible, and so far it was working out. On this training weekend, they would be at the park overnight. They would find a camp spot toward the end of the day. The pair settled on a cleared and level spot close to Cole Creek, and they pitched their tent. After supper, they looked into the campfire and talked until near midnight. Leonard didn't follow the current teen culture, and he had no idea what or who Amanda was talking about, but he nodded his head and commented when she took a breath. He didn't care, and neither did his daughter. He was happy for the fact that she would talk to him about things, and she was happy that he listened. In mid-sentence, Leonard looked at his daughter, and he saw that she had nodded off. He smiled and got her up and ushered her into the tent and got her secure in her sleeping bag. He crawled in and he did the same, and they both immediately went to sleep. Something jerked Leonard's arm. He thought it was Amanda rolling over, but the nudge was too abrupt. It was almost violent. Reaching for the light hung from the tent roof, he flipped it on and he looked over to make sure Amanda was covered. There was an unusual chill on the clear June night. Amanda wasn't there, and neither was her sleeping bag. Well, maybe she had gotten up to use the bathroom, but he had to check on her, though. Standing over the smoldering coals of their campfire, he looked around the site for a light. He knew that she would use a flashlight to find her way to a private place to pee. There was no light. Amanda, he yelled. The explosion of activity that broke the silence made him jump. Directly in front of him and at the edge of the trees, more than four huge shadows went from a distinct outline in the available light to nothing as they burst away into the woods and down the ridge from the campsite. 
Leonard clicked on his light and pointed it in that direction, and then he ran to the tree, stopping before heading down the ridge. The noise the animals were making was absurd in his mind. Nothing moved like a dozer through the trees like that in these woods. And in the furthest point that his light would show any detail in his last glimpse of their movement, he saw Amanda's sleeping bag dragging the ground behind one of the animals. Hanging out the open end of the bag was his daughter's socked feet. Leonard, fully dressed, ran back to the tent and tied his boots on. With a light strapped to his head and a flashlight, he sprinted to the tree line and bailed off the ridge, running full speed in pursuit of his daughter. He didn't know what he was chasing, but he knew for sure that he would kill every one of these people or animals that had taken his treasure. He would kill every last one of them. Hook Johnson pitched Steve Lilly a beer from the Igloo Cooler. Lewis Shanks had just opened one and was in no need of a fresh soda. An additional, more than ten people, sat in lawn chairs or stood close to the grill talking and laughing. And in the smoker were pork ribs, butts, and shoulders. Steve started the fire early that morning. There was no way to cook in a trailer park or have a cooler full of beer and not draw a crowd. The men knew this ahead of time and they bought enough meat and beer for the occasion. Now, this wasn't a cook for the trailer park. It had been planned for the three Squatch hunters and friends. But as all things go in a trailer park, everyone was wandering over. You think we bought enough beer? Asked Lewis. There's two cases in that cooler. The private stash is in the house. When this one runs out, head inside and refill your hand, said Hook. That's right, said Steve Lilly, but don't let any of these crackheads in my house be stealthy about refilling your hand. Are you afraid someone's going to steal that nice sofa that Lilly lays on all day? Asked Lewis. Well, we would see him if that happened, said Steve. They're brave, but I don't think they want to work hard enough to steal that big-ass piece of furniture. I'm more concerned with the silverware and the art. Well, you're a cultured man, Steve, said Hook. What's that art worth now, six dollars? It's an investment, Hook, said Lily. Give it time. That stuff will be worth twelve dollars by the time I retire. I'm doubling my money. Sounds like a solid retirement plan, said Lewis. I might want some of that action. Listen and learn, boys, said Steve. Changing the subject, Lewis asked Steve, You know all these motherfuckers, Steve? Well, you live here too, Lewis. How many of them do you know? Not many, fucking freeloaders, said Lewis. He finished his beer and walked to the cooler to recan his hand. And when he came back, he said, If many more show up, I'm going to start running these people off. I don't mind sharing our food and beer, but there are dudes walking around here with a beer in each pocket like they own the place. You need to build a fence, man. I think I'll try an experiment, said Steve. Oh, shit, said Hook. Lily walked over to a group of men that he knew. They lived on the other side of the trailer park, but he had become friends with them. They were immigrants from Mexico, and no less than 20 of them lived in one single wide trailer two rows over. Steve had been changing a fuel pump in his truck the year before and was having trouble with it. His cussing could be heard all over the neighborhood. With busted knuckles wrapped around a Budweiser, he had taken a break and sat with Lily, that's his dog, on the tailgate of his truck. Several of the Mexicans walked by. One of the Mexicans who spoke English asked Steve what the problem was with his truck. And in ten minutes, six Mexicans were hovering under his truck and under the hood helping him fix it. Thirty minutes later, the diesel engine roared to life and the job was done. And Steve showed his gratitude by telling them to take the whole cooler with a half case of beer remaining on ice. And in that gesture, a solid friendship formed. They spent many weekends in Steve's backyard during the hot months, sitting in the shade and having a few cold beers and getting to know each other. And Steve approached the Mexicans. How many of these people do you boys know? asked Steve. 
Ah, uh, maybe half of them. I don't think the other half live here, Steve. You want us to ask them to leave? It was Isabel Garza. Steve didn't know many Mexicans, but of the ones he knew, Isabel was the easiest to communicate with. Isabel was the de facto leader of the immigrants who lived in the area. He was the go-to guy for illegals. He found them jobs and gave them a place to stay while they were in the States working, and he got a small percentage of their checks each week in cash in return for his services. Now, Isabel didn't live in the trailer park. He had a nice house in a lower middle class area of Memphis, but he was at the trailer park several times each day making sure his men were working and behaving and not drawing attention to themselves. That was important for his business. His mission was to help the men work and send money home and get home when they were ready to leave. It was a business, and he watched over it like a hawk. Isabel, I can run them off, but I need to get this meat off the smoker and inside so I can help Angela get it ready to serve. If it's not too much trouble, can you take control of this crowd for me, said Steve. Yeah, no problem, boss, said Isabel. He turned to the four men with him and said something to them quickly and ghibli. Immediately, they followed Isabel into the growing mass of people to begin thinning the uninvited guests. Steve headed for the smoker, and he pulled two shoulders off the grill and headed inside with Angela. Hey, boys, if this gets rowdy, can you fellas step in and calm everybody down? Isabel's about to start asking people to leave, Steve said to Lewis and Hook as he walked onto the back porch and vanished into the house. Lewis looked at Hook and said, Oh, this is a great experiment. Shit's about to hit the fan, brother. Hook nodded but didn't reply. They both sat back in their lawn chairs and watched for the festivities to commence. Isabel had spoken to three of the party crashers and they complied with his request by walking toward the front of Lily's trailer with their friends in tow, but the fourth one looked to be a bit more difficult. Now Hook knew this guy, had had run-ins with him before, and he knew this was not going to end well. It became a certainty when the man called Isabel a fucking Mexican, and before Hook and Lewis could react and move toward the coming altercation, the man ran his hand up the small of his back and produced a knife that looked like a K-bar, and he stabbed down at Isabel's head. But before he could bring the knife down, Isabel stepped into him while turning his back to the man, pushing the attacker's momentum backward and in one motion he gripped the man's knife and brought it down over his shoulder. Hook heard the distinct crack, and he knew that Isabel had hyperextended the man's arm at the elbow, dislocated the bones, and tore a few ligaments. The knife fell to the ground, and it was snatched up by one of Isabel's buddies. The two men, who had been standing behind Knife Man, began to move forward just in time for Lewis and Hook to arrive. Back up, said Lewis and they complied. The four Mexicans standing behind Isabel never moved or changed the expressions on their face. Isabel reached down, and he helped the knife man up and pointed him toward the front yard. Without a word, the three party crashers walked away. The crowd now were only neighbors from the trailer park. That's a cool move, Isabel, said Lewis. Were you in the military or something? Nah, said Isabel. I picked that up somewhere along the way. Come on, said Hook. Everybody grab a cold soda. The food's going to be ready any time. Lewis looked at the Mexicans. Put your chairs over here, boys. Sit with us, he said. Isabel said something to the others in Spanish, and they walked back to the area where they were standing before. Isabel walked back to the smoker with Hook and Lewis, and he sat down in an empty chair. Tell them to come sit with us, said Lewis. Ah, they don't speak English. It's not comfortable for them. They're okay over there. Steve and Angela walked back onto the porch and off into the yard toward the table that sat in the middle. Come and eat, fellas, Steve said. And then turning to Lewis and Hook, he said, Looks like the crowd thinned out. Thanks for that, Isabel. I'll be back in a minute. And he walked inside to help Angela bring out more items. By 11 p.m. that evening, only five people remained in the yard. They sat in lawn chairs listening to the Memphis traffic in the distance and the buzzing locusts singing from the trees. 
Smoke from a quickly made fire in the pit rose into the cloudless sky with only coals smoldering below. Angela sat next to Steve and they both sat across the fire from Lewis, Hook, and Isabel. I'm sorry you had to deal with that guy today, Isabel, said Steve. I didn't know him. Had no idea he'd do that. Some people are just stupid. I wish I could have seen your ninja move, though. Yeah, that was impressive, said Hook. I don't think I can make that move, said Lewis. I'm not agile enough. I guess he'd just have to stab me. Nope, you'd have shot him the second he called you a fucking Mexican, said Hook. Yeah, I would have done that, Lewis agreed. But then I'd be in jail about now, so it's a good thing Isabel was here. They talked for another 30 minutes watching the planes fly in and out of the Memphis airport. Isabel got up to leave. I'm going to go, fellas. I might see my kids before they go to bed. Thanks for the food. My friends had a great time, he said. Come on back any time, said Steve. You know I'm here if you men ever need anything. Isabel nodded and began folding his lawn chair. Steve's burner phone rang. Hook and Lewis knew what this call was about. It was the phone only used for Squatch Kill admissions. When Steve hung up, he said, We got some work, boys. We got to leave now. Why does he always call at night? asked Hook. How about a daytime gig now and then? Shit, I need some sleep. That's why they pay us the big bucks, killer. How about we take your excursion? We always take my excursion, Steve. She's getting some miles on her. Maybe we need to start a team vehicle fund and get something fresher, said Hook. Damn, that's a good idea, Hook, said Lewis. I'm going in to get my shit. I'll meet you boys out front in five. We don't have far to go, Steve said as they walked toward the trailer. Lily followed. She knew when these jobs started and didn't want to be left outside all night. Lewis headed toward his trailer while Hook sat looking into the coals of the dying fire and contemplated the universe. He hadn't noticed Isabel still standing next to him. What sort of work did you guys do? asked Isabel. Hook, a bit startled, said, Uh, we hunt problem wildlife for the government. It's just a side job, not a full-time gig, but we gotta go when they call. So you hunt predators, here, in Tennessee, Isabel said. Yeah, you wouldn't think there would be many here, but we stay pretty busy, said Hook. Oh, that's cool. Is the pay any good? That's not bad, or we wouldn't do it, said Hook. You guys hunt like mountain lions and coyotes and stuff? Yeah, something like that, said Hook, trying to be as obscure as he could be. He wanted this conversation to end. Yeah, I started hunting coyotes when I was a kid in Arizona. My father took me a lot. We had a lot of fun. I still hunt them now. Do you know there are as many coyotes in this area as there are out west? Oh, yeah, they're everywhere, said Hook. I have my rifle in my car. What if I came along with you guys? Uh... That's not a good idea. It gets kind of hairy out there if there's a big pack of coyotes. Maybe another time, Isabel, said Hook, hoping that would end the conversation. Hell yeah, you can go, said Steve, who had just stepped off the porch with two rifles and his other gear strapped in various places on his body. You can bring your rifle, but we have some weapons you might prefer. Where's Lewis, Hook? Lewis was already back at the excursion, loading his gear. Isabel headed toward Lewis in the vehicle. This is a bad idea, Steve. That man has a family. I hope this is an easy gig because someone's going to have to keep their eye on Isabel, said Hook. Hook, this is as bad as they get, said Steve. Multiple targets and a little girl missing. We're going to need an extra hand and Isabel can handle himself, right? You saw that today. That fucker isn't afraid of anything. Yeah, but he thinks we're hunting coyotes, Steve, said Hook. We'll explain the whole thing to him before we get out of Memphis. If he wants to back out, we can drop him at his house. I think he's going to want in on this. That dude's meaner than shit and he likes making money. That's a good combination for us. All right, I'll let you do the talking. I'm tired of talking, said Hook. Leonard Cates crouched behind a thick growth of vines and briars. Based on what was happening in front of him 
and for a moment he wished he had not been so quick to chase after whoever had taken his daughter. But if he hadn't chased the kidnappers all night through the woods, he wouldn't have an eye on Amanda. And in spite of not having a weapon to try to get his daughter back, he was glad that he had chased them down. It was better to know than not to know where she was being held and have a weapon. But now he had to think. He had to make a plan. There was no way that he could take on the whole crowd of creatures that milled about the creature nest. There had to be twenty, maybe more. These things were some sort of ape, but not an ape. They walked straight up on two legs, yet their movements would often look like apes. They had been loud when he first approached the nest, and after losing the creatures in his mad six-hour-long chase, he heard the strangest commotion over a ridge. He eased to the crest and looked over to find this pack of wild animals seemingly celebrating the capture of his daughter. After moving down the slope a bit and taking up the position that he was now in, he saw what they were and he knew that he just couldn't walk in and fight his way to Amanda. An hour passed and Leonard saw the beasts one by one begin to lay on leaf bedding and go to sleep. Only two remained awake. He assumed they were the lookouts, but to his surprise, the last two laid close to Amanda and appeared to drift off into sleep. Amanda fought with the vines that had been wrapped around her body to secure her, but she couldn't break free. One of the lookouts would sit up and growl at her when she made enough noise to annoy him. Leonard thought he saw her chest heaving as she wept. There was his daughter in the hands of a vicious-looking creature, and there was nothing he could do about it. Frustration began to build. He had to move, get out of earshot of the nest, and call for help. Leonard moved so slow back up the hill that it took him an hour to travel 50 yards to the crest. The sun was shining through the trees. Not knowing how sensitive the creature's sense of hearing was, he chose to be as quiet as a mouse, along with keeping any vegetation that he could find between himself and the nest. And when he reached the top, he descended to the bottom of the ridge and he climbed another. He had to make some phone calls, and the higher he was in elevation, the better he thought the chances of getting a cell phone signal were. Not knowing the phone numbers of the local fish and wildlife office or the sheriff's office, he dialed 911 and he waited. And when the call ended, he felt no better about the situation. They took him serious and they were sure his daughter was in danger, but they didn't believe that creatures were holding her hostage. It was plain to Leonard that they thought he was crazy, but they would send someone to the area now. But the next problem was finding him. Leonard didn't know where he was and he couldn't give them a location. He remembered crossing a gravel park road at some point during the chase, but that was hours ago. All he could tell them was that he had not crossed the Mississippi River. He was still on the Tennessee side, he knew that for sure. He thought he was somewhere between Cold Creek Chute and the river. It was the best he could do. Cell phone location technology was sketchy. They might locate him within a mile or two, but that was it. The dispatcher asked him to start walking and call her back when he hit a road or a trail. Leonard would not leave his daughter. They would just have to find him. It would take hours, if not a whole day and night, and he knew it. His only hope was that the creatures would sleep all day and not wake until dark. The sun would set in ten hours. If they found him after that, he knew whatever the animals had in store for his daughter, and he could only guess what that was. He would not be in a position to get her out. His last resort would be to charge down on them and try to grab her. But that was hopeless, and he knew it. And he prayed that help would soon arrive. Nine hundred miles away, in an obscure office building, and under the business name of an accounting firm, Agent Red placed an incident report on Agent Blue's desk. He looked over the high points and he said, 
Let's activate our Memphis team and get them moving to the site. Get the man's location with our satellite and send them straight to him. We don't have time to gather a full intel package. If they don't make it there soon, that little girl's not going to make it. It's already done, Chief, said Agent Red. They're en route as we speak. Well, good work, Red. How soon can they be there? They're close to the site now. They should make contact with the father any time, she said. Well, how did they get there so fast? asked Blue. Orange and Red got a hit in the state park last week. We picked up some Facebook chatter about encounters in the area. They began scanning the area for creatures, and boy, did they find them. It appeared to be a larger-than-average clan. They were gathering intel for the Memphis team last night. They were watching the clan on infrared and actually watched the creatures take the girl from the tent. We were going to recommend sending the Memphis team in next week anyway, but this has sped things up a bit. Agent Red stood in front of her boss with an air of accomplishment, but a worried look in her eyes. Had Orange and Green not found this clan, I doubt we would have a chance at getting this child back. We got lucky on this one. I would say the chances are still low, but we have a chance. If anyone can get it done, it's the Lily crew. I activated them last night, and I was going to brief you this morning in our meeting. Well, I agree. Those guys are savages, and if they can get to her, she might just come home. Good work, Red. Now keep me posted on the mission, said Blue, as his eyes skeptically scanned the report. He imperceptibly shook his head and thought of his 13-year-old daughter at home. Everyone knew it was a long shot to save this child, but at least with the Memphis team there, the odds were not zero. They were close, but not zero. The Memphis crew stepped out of the excursion into a muddy field. The excursion was stuck. The intelligence they had received showed the clan south and west of Crutcher's Lake, an oxbow north of a more recently formed oxbow called Cold Creek Chute. The Squatch Nest was between the river and the chute on the ground that appeared to be elevated out of the water. To get as close as possible and to avoid long hours of walking, the team opted to get the vehicles as close to the nest as possible, something they rarely did. The gravel roads were a gift from heaven, but it was the short drive back south in the fields that caused them problems. They had almost made it to the spot where they wanted to park when the excursion tires sank into the deep gumbo and began to spin. It wasn't that much further and they could worry about getting the excursion out after the job was done. Whenever the team had guests hunting with them, either for the hell of it or out of necessity, Explaining what they were about to do was usually a touchy subject and most people thought they were full of it and putting them on a snipe hunting joke. But that was not the case with Isabel. Now we aren't hunting coyotes, Isabel. We're going to kill some Bigfoots, Steve had said in a matter-of-fact way shortly after they were on the road. There was a long silence in the car for several minutes. None of them spoke a word. They were letting Isabel process the words he had just heard. But the time was getting short. Hook was about to drive past an exit that would take Isabel home, so he asked, All right, are you in or out, Isabel? I'm in, man. You know, I've seen Bigfoot before. I know they're real. And when I saw the weapons you had in the back, I knew you weren't using that stuff on coyotes. It had to be something bigger. Just tell me what you need me to do. I'm in, said Isabel sitting back in his seat, laying his head back on the headrest. Okay, said Lewis. Steve, get us up to speed on what we're walking into. Agent Red says that there's a pack of squatches up close to Fort Pillow. Now, this would normally be an op that we could plan, but there's a little girl taken from a campsite a few hours ago. They're still getting a heat signature on her, so she is alive. Now, we need to get her out. Taking bounties is not an objective today. Getting this girl back is all we need to do, said Steve. Lewis reached back and snatched the laptop from Steve's hand to look at the satellite image that he was looking at on the screen. He pondered the screen, running his finger over the glowing light in his lap. 
Then he handed the computer back to Steve. I count 22 squatches, Steve. They're all asleep. That kid does appear to be alive, he said, and he moved his eyes back to the road in front of them. 22, said Hook. That's what it looks like, said Steve. Not another word was said in the excursion until Isabel said, We can take them. With their gear on and now loaded down with rifles and ammunition, the team of four walked to the edge of the trees. They stopped, and Steve pulled a phone from his pocket. And after a few keystrokes, he hit send and waited. What are we waiting on? asked Lewis. Leonard's phone vibrated in his pocket. A text from a number he didn't recognize waited to be read. Walk 300 yards due north until you see our light was the message. Leonard looked at his watch. It was 9.14 a.m. He had made the call to 911 only 30 minutes ago and had moved back to keep an eye on his daughter while the creature slept. How had anyone found him that fast, he thought and who had sent the text. He knew if he left the area, he might not find his way back. Leonard was great on trails, but not a good navigator in the woods without landmarks or trails to follow. He replied to the text message, I can't leave. I won't be able to find my way back to this spot. A response came back immediately. We know where you are and where your daughter is. We have a plan to get her out. Walk 300 yards north. We will explain. Reluctantly, Leonard slid down the hill slowly and began making his way in a large sweeping loop so that he could begin his trek north. In 30 minutes, he saw a small red light ahead in the trees. Men were standing there. He adjusted his course toward them and the Memphis Squatch Hunters came into view. Are you okay? asked Lewis. Well, I'm fine, but those fuckers have my daughter. I'd have gone in and got her, but there's a bunch of them, said Leonard. Well, hell, there's 22 of them, said Steve, and he held the screen of the laptop in front of Leonard's face so that he could see. There's your daughter, and she's alive. Now, what's your name? Leonard Cates. My daughter's name is Amanda. Leonard Cates from Humes High School, said Hook. What? Yeah, I went to Hume's for two years. I didn't finish. There was a brief moment of disbelief from Hook and Steve as they stood there looking at the man who had shaken them both down for cash more than once. And while Hook and Steve had not gone to Hume's high school, they knew exactly who they were talking to. Leonard had made the rounds and taken several hundred dollars off kids in the neighborhood. You owe me exactly $62.50, said Hook. What the hell are you talking about, said Steve. How did you get the number sixty-two fifty, Hook? I cut yards for a month to make that cash when I was 12, said Hook. I was on my piece of shit bike on my way to the Schwinn store to buy a new one when this asshole grabbed me on Summer Avenue, beat the hell out of me, and then took everything out of my front pocket. Then he stomped on my bike and I had to walk home. Hook turned to Leonard. But you didn't get all of it, you son of a bitch. I had another hundred dollars in my back pocket. You didn't get that, you chicken shit thief. The rest of the guys were astonished that this conversation was even taking place. None of them knew what to say. Hook had moved closer to Leonard, almost like he was about to knock the shit out of him. But Steve stepped between them. No one looked more stunned than Kate's. It was a lifetime ago for him, and he had not thought of those years in some time. But he remembered Hook and immediately began to apologize. Look, man, I'm sorry about all that. I was a bad kid, and I hurt a lot of people, but I'm not that way now. Now, my daughter is in there. Are you guys going to help me get her out or not? Well, why do you think we're here? asked Lewis. How about you white boys settle your shit later? There's a 12-year-old girl in there surrounded by squatches. Now, what are we going to do? Leonard looked back at Hook. I'll make all that up to you, Hook. Just please give me a hand and help me get my daughter out. A warm sense of empathy washed over Hook. He put his hand on Leonard's shoulder and he rocked him back and forth. 
All right, let's go get her, said Hook. Please tell me, how did you fellas get here so fast, said Leonard. We'll tell you later, said Steve. Take five minutes and tell me everything you can about what's going on in that nest, and then we're going to come up with a plan. After Leonard relayed the details, the team gathered around the hood of Hook's excursion and threw together a plan. There would need to be a distraction, so two of the men would approach from the north and start making noise to wake the Squatches up and get them to come investigate. But not all of them would come, and they knew that. Several would stay in the nest or they would flee south toward the river. That meant that the other two would have to work their way south of the nest and catch the squatches that fled in an ambush. The big question was how many beasts would go each way. There was no way to predict their reaction to the commotion to the north, but at the moment, it was the best plan they could come up with. And in the middle of the mayhem that was about to ensue, someone had to rescue Amanda. They didn't know if the Squatches would try to protect their hostage or run, leaving her behind, but they hoped for the latter. Now, Leonard, put this in your ear. You're going to be able to communicate with us on this device. Now, take this rifle and these three magazines. Now, I'm going to assume you know how to use a rifle, said Steve. I know how to use a rifle, said Leonard. Okay, now I want you to go back to the place where you were watching the nest. If anything comes your way after the creatures start moving, shoot them. But only if they're coming your way. Now remember that your daughter will be in the middle of all this. Check your fire and do not shoot your daughter. Steve, do you think this is going to work? Asked Leonard. Well, we won't know until we try. I'm hoping to keep these fuckers so busy that they forget about your daughter. And if they do, I want you to get down that hill and get her out. But I need to let you know that if one of these beasts gets a hold of you, you will not survive, said Steve. Make believe they have $60 in their fucking pocket, said Hook. You're going to have to be that mean again. Let's get Amanda out, said Leonard. I'm going to kill as many as I can find. That's my boy, said Steve. Lewis and Steve left first. They would move in a wide arc and circle south behind the nest and set up as close as they could get. Hook and Isabel would provide the distraction. They walked into the hot summer Delta forest. Give me a sit, Rep, said Agent Blue, poking his head into the situation room. Orange, green, and red sat at a table and watched the events on a 75-inch monitor that hung on the wall at the end of the table. Illuminated figures began to enter the woods. Two stopped a few hundred yards into the woods, while three began making a wide easterly arc around the nest. They're moving into position, said Red. You want to watch the show with us? I think I will, said Blue. Are you seeing any activity from local law enforcement since the 911 call? Nothing, said Orange. Lily and his crew are on their own. It's probably better that way. Agreed, said Blue. Of the three figures who had been moving to the southern end of the nest, one broke off taking an abrupt right and heading west. He was moving slower now and the observers correctly decided that he was climbing an incline and moving slow so as not to be detected. The two figures to the north had apparently settled into their positions 50 yards from the nest. The southern team kept moving. Have they ever taken on this many creatures? asked Green. No, said Red, but this mission has one objective. This isn't a kill mission. Or did you explain that to Lily? asked Orange. I did, said Red, but we all know what he's going to do if he can get the girl safely out. Yes, we do, said Blue. Yes, we do. Looks like they're set up, said Green. Here we go. Turn on the audio to their comms, said Blue. Connect us. The red figures on the screen were motionless. They were waiting. All hell was about to break out in the Delta. Are we set? asked Hook over the comms. Leonard spoke up in a whisper. What if they head straight west? We'll lose her then. 
there's a bluff over there. They'd have to jump 30 feet down onto a sandbar, and then they'd be in the river. They won't go west, said Steve. Now get ready, Leonard, and talk to us and let us know if they do something crazy before they get to us. Got it, said Leonard. Okay, Huck, you and Isabel start making some noise. Get them moving. Steve, why haven't we seen any centuries around, said Huck. They don't have any lookouts. That's awful strange. I don't know, but I haven't seen any on the infrared. If they were there, we would have seen them. Now start making some noise, said Steve. All right, here we go, said Hook, and the comms went dead. Hook produced a smartphone from his pocket and pulled up a music app. He clicked on a selection of Mexican mariachi music. The trumpets and the squeeze box and the guitars began to play and then he turned the volume up as loud as he could, and he placed the phone in the fork of a dogwood sapling. Hook looked over at Isabel and smiled, and with an ear-to-ear grin, Isabel gave Hook a big thumbs up. They each moved away from the phone, taking up positions with a clear killing field in front of them. Can you hear that? Steve asked Lewis. It's better than you singing, said Lewis. You wish I was singing. Lock and load, said Lewis. This is going to get hairy. Above the nest, Leonard watched as several of the squatches were rousted from a good sleep. They were rubbing their eyes and scratching their asses, seemingly pissed that they had been woken up by an intruder. Half of the beast moved to the north end of the gigantic nest and stopped to listen to the mariachi music. The other half were just now beginning to stand. One of the beasts walked over to Amanda and screamed at her. She burst into tears. It was the first time Leonard had seen her face since she had been taken. She was dirty and she looked exhausted, but she was alive. He breathed a sigh and moved the scope to the head of the animal that had screamed at her. Now, Leonard, I know you want to start shooting, but trust me, you need to wait. Do not shoot at anything unless they come at you. Now we need to get in there and get your daughter when these nasty things start moving. And if you shoot now, they're going to likely come at you. And we can't help you if that happens. Steve's voice over the comms was soothing and confidence building. Leonard eased his finger out of the trigger guard and he waited. Isabel, I'm going to move up 20 yards and start talking to him. This music isn't working. Let's get him close before you shoot. Make your shots count, said Hook. Isabel watched the big man start his walk forward. When Hook stopped, he began calling the Squatches every foul name he could think of. He screamed at them for a solid minute. They heard the creatures coming at them now. Isabel tightened his grip on the AR-10 and began scanning the woods with the scope. Isabel, you see that big oak tree between us out front? You take everything to the right of that tree, and I'll take everything to the left. They're coming. A huge water-swollen trunk of a tree stood out among all the others in the area. When Isabel looked at it, behind it, he saw the second squatch he had seen in his life, and it was twice the size of the animal he had seen years ago. He allowed the creature to creep up even with the tree, keeping the red dot centered on its nose, and when the rifle bucked into his shoulder, he got to see the creature's head explode. Chunks of brain, skull, and sinus cavity rained down on the leaves. He heard Hook shoot twice. Good shot, hombre, said Hook. Stay alert. The image of the creature's face before it exploded revolted Isabel. The beasts were the ugliest things he had ever seen. Killing more would be a pleasure. He was starting to have fun. We have a problem, Houston, Lily's voice came over the comms. Not a single Squatch is heading to Lewis and me. We're coming to you, Hook. I guess we'll come at them from behind. We're heading your way. Don't shoot us. Only two creatures had made it to the team to the north side. Everything was quiet. Hook thought that they should have heard a stampede coming at them, but there was nothing. Steve, I'm not seeing anything other than the two we took down. Hook immediately looked at his portable monitor, which showed the satellite image. He could see the twenty who were left, but they were moving slow. They were spreading out a little, creeping toward his position. Where's the kid, he said. I don't see her in the nest. 
One of them has her, broke in Leonard. I'm moving down the hill. I'm going to fall in with the others. Steve and Lewis were running now, and when Steve broke in on the comms, it was obvious by his breathing. Don't come down the hill, Leonard. Follow that ridge as far as you can to the north. We need you up there. Try to keep pace with that pack of squatches. Well, what about Amanda? Leonard screamed. We're going to get her. Now just go, now, said Lewis. Leonard jumped to his feet and started running. He found a wildlife path on top of the ridge, making it easier than fighting through the brush. He kept pace with the pack, but still couldn't see Amanda. And a deep dread washed over him. He had to get to her. In Steve's mind, they had to squeeze this pack and get them grouped together so they could begin killing them faster. If he and Lewis could push them from the south while Hook and Isabel advanced from the north, they would eventually meet and it could possibly be a slaughter. He didn't want to think about the bounties and the huge money that would be the payout if they were able to kill 22 squatches in one mission. But still, as he ran, he was trying to do the math in his head to come up with a total. The numbers stopped computing in his mind when he found Amanda's sleeping bag lying in the middle of the nest. Nope, we're here to get this girl out, he thought. Forget that money. In front of Lewis, he saw a squatch jogging along like it was getting its daily exercise in. Lewis picked up his pace a bit and then stopped and shot the creature in the back, dropping it to the ground, but it was still alive. Lewis started running again and he never stopped at the bleeding and furious Bigfoot. As he ran by, he put two more rounds in the thing's neck and head. Leaves were kicking up behind Lewis shanks. He was running. Damn, Lewis, slow down. You're making me look bad, said Steve. In front of Lily were two creatures who had turned and were facing him. That's when he picked up the pace and ran faster toward them. Now, they didn't expect that. Most living things run away from them, but this crazy human was coming full speed. They didn't know how to react. That's when two rounds each snapped their heads back and they dropped to the ground in heaps. Steve ran by the newly made Squatch corpses and yelled into his mic, Now I feel better, Lewis. No one knew the number of Squatches left alive, so they had no way to know how many were left to do battle with. But one thing was certain. One of them had Amanda under its arm, and if the five men began randomly shooting at anything that moved, they might hit the girl. Steve stopped abruptly and, not hearing any shots fired, began to speak again to the whole team. Boys, we can't shoot with reckless abandon. The girl's under the arm of one of those monsters. If you're going to have to pick your shots, shooting discipline has never been more important. Does everyone copy? In the years since they began hunting Bigfoot, they had never had to be conscious of where they placed their shots. This was an added dimension to the game. A life and death game. A voice they knew but didn't expect to hear became audible in their earpieces. It was Agent Red. Guys, you have 16 creatures equal distant between your two teams. They're bunched up together with four standing at the perimeters. The child is in the arm of the creature on the far west of the group. The creature is closest to your man on the northwest. If he can get close and make a kill shot, you can open up randomly on the group. Do you copy? There was a brief silence before Lily responded. Why am I hearing you on our walkie-talkies, Agent Red? Steve, we can talk about that later. Now get moving and think of a way to draw the creature with the child away from the pack. Put your thinking cap on, boy. Steve hit his mic, forgetting again that others could hear them speaking. Man, I hope she hadn't heard me talking about her while we're out on these gigs, he said to the others. Instead of one of the team responding, it was Agent Red again. I've heard it all, dummy. Now get to the girl. Go. Lily was afraid to say anything now. His face was turning red, thinking about the sexual thoughts he had imagined about Agent Red and had conveyed to Hook and Lewis over the same communication gear that had been issued to them by the outfit for which they worked. It was all in fun, he thought. Maybe she would understand that. Lewis walked up to Steve and said, Damn boy, snap out of it. Any ideas on getting the girl? I can see her. 
The voice was Leonard's. She's the farthest away from me, but I can see the Mexican guy just 30 or 40 yards away from her. Can you take a shot? He was asking Isabel directly. I can take a shot, but I'm never having used this rifle. I'm not confident I won't hit her. Hook, can you see the squatch with the girl? I can't see her, Hook said from the northeast position. But I have at least ten standing in the woods ready to be cut down. They're just standing there. I don't get it. What do you think they're doing, boys? Isabel thought about the situation. He also thought about his daughters at home and how he would feel if his girl were draped under the arm of one of these filthy animals. Start shooting, Hook. I have a plan, Isabel said while he moved the rifle in his hands to his back. All right, Isabel, say when, he heard Hook say. When, shouted Isabel through the mic. Steve, Lewis, and Hook began firing at the same time. All three had eyes on Beast that held the twelve-year-old girl in its arms, or they knew it wasn't in their field of fire. Shots also rained down from the ridge from Leonard. He had held off as long as he could. The Beast went crazy and several charged in various directions, looking for the source of their pain. Isabel, keeping his eye on the beast and holding the girl, reached into the back of his shirt and extracted a knife. It was a long blade he kept on him while dealing with the lowlifes that lived in the places where his people lived and harassed them constantly. He pulled the knife cleanly from the leather sheath strapped to his body. He leaned forward, knife in hand, and sprinted straight at the big male holding the little girl. And when the monster saw him coming, he dropped the child and charged back at the crazy Mexican. At the last moment, Isabel dropped to the ground and slid between the legs of the giant beast like he was sliding into third base, and he sliced upward while gliding in the slick mud below the leaves. And when he came up on his feet on the other side, he turned and prepared for another charge. The creature's testicles had not been completely cut away from its body. They hung in a nauseating hanging mass of blood and flesh where he had sliced open the scrotum but left both testicles hanging free in the open. They dangled a foot and a half where they had seconds before been nestled tightly against the creature's body. It had not even turned to face Isabel. It was in too much pain. Seeing his chance, and with the beast facing the other way, Isabel jumped onto the squatch's back, climbed to its shoulders, and wrapping his right arm around the front of the beast's head, and then pulling the sharp blade across the animal's throat, severing its windpipe, its gut tube, and apparently both carotid arteries. Blood began to soak his sleeves, and the animal's head tilted backward, hitting Isabel in the nose. He released his grip and landed on both feet, ready to deal with another attack that never came. The squatch dropped to its knees and then fell face first in the leaves. It never took another breath. Isabel brought his rifle around from his back, brought the stock to his shoulder and yelled into the mic, I had the girl kill them all. Leonard at that point abandoned his position and ran full speed down the steep hill. Several squatches still remained on their feet. Lewis saw him running straight into their field of fire and immediately told the others to stop shooting. It took a minute for the bullets to stop flying, but when they did, Leonard broke out on flat ground with his rifle at his shoulder. He was trying to get to Amanda, but as he ran, he caught three squatches by surprise and killed them as he ran past. When he had reached Amanda and Isabel, the team resumed the squatch slaughter until the remaining beasts lay on the ground. None of them were moving. When he reached his daughter, he scooped her up in his arms and he held her tight. Isabel watched the reunion with a tear forming in his eye. He had been terribly afraid of taking on an animal as vicious and as big as this Sasquatch was with a knife but the results were priceless to watch. Can you believe we killed 22 of these, mother? Lewis checked his mouth before the vile phrase came out. The young girl was in hearing distance. It's a new record, said Huck. It's a new record for heads and dollars, said Steve. Good work, fellas, said Agent Red in their earpieces. 
After the adrenaline-filled last 10 minutes, they had once again forgotten that their comms were being monitored by others. Steve Lilly's face began to turn red again, thinking about the trash he had talked about Agent Red. Uh, you know there, Agent Red, I was just playing if you've ever heard me say anything racy about you. You know, we just mess around out here, that's all it is. Forget it, Steve. She cut him off in mid-sentence. You can explain if we ever meet, but from now on, you keep your mouth shut about what you think my boobs look like. Is that clear to you? Alone in the office with her co-workers, she was trying her best not to laugh, and the others in the command center were silently laughing with her. You fellas need to concentrate on getting Leonard and his daughter to their car so they can get home. And by the way, your excursion has been moved to the gravel. Just walk on out and get those two on their way home. You still have work to do at this site if you want to be paid. Will ears suffice in lieu of heads this time? Asked Steve. Ears are acceptable, they heard Agent Blue say in the background of whatever room they were talking from. Exceptional job, men. You will hear from us again soon. All right, let's get you two to the car, said Hook, looking over at Leonard and Amanda. Father and daughter followed the men to their vehicle. At the trailhead where they dropped the pair off, Amanda hugged each man for a long time, thanking them for saving her. You need to thank your father, said Hook. He followed you all night through some of the nastiest woods a man can crawl through. He knew where you were being held, and if he had not done that, we wouldn't be here. Your daddy saved you. Amanda jumped into her father's arms. Can we go home now, Dad? Let's go, he said, and he walked her to the passenger door and opened it and strapped her seat belt over her shoulder. He walked back and stood in front of Hook Johnson. And he reached in his pocket and held out a $100 bill. Keep it, said Hook. You're not the same person I knew way back then. Now have a good life, Leonard Cates. You have a lot to be proud of. Leonard nodded and stuffed the bill into Hook's shirt pocket, and he got in his car and he drove away with his daughter. At 5.15 p.m., the excursion pulled into the parking lot of the crew's favorite Chinese buffet. The men piled out and walked inside, after eating a mountain of food, they sat in silence looking at their plates and sipping their drinks. What would you think about that today? Steve asked Isabel. It was a good day, man. Would you do another hunt? Asked Lewis. I'd do it again right now if you had something lined up, Isabel said. So you liked it, Hook stated. It wasn't a question. Yeah, I can't explain why I liked it. Maybe it's the action, but yeah, if you guys need an extra hand on one of these again, give me a call. But I'm curious, though. What's a bounty on a Sasquatch? Well, you're going to find out in a day or two when they pay us, said Steve. I'll call you when the money shows up. We're going to split it with you. How much do you think hunting these things is worth? Let's say per head. Dude, if I can make $500 a head... I would do the squatch hunting thing all the time. Isabel said, grinning at the others, never once thinking that anyone would pay $500 for a predator bounty. Their Mexican friend didn't know it yet, but he was about to get a quarter cut of a $440,000 payment. There was no doubt now that Isabel Garza would be the new fourth member of the Memphis squatch hunting team. The four men got up from the table and walked to the counter to pay their bill. Hook dropped the $100 bill down on the counter that Leonard had stuffed in his pocket. Was that meal worth that ass whooping Leonard gave you when you were a kid? Asked Lewis. Hell yeah, it was worth it, Steve broke in. Maybe he'll whip your ass again and we'll get another feast out of it. No, it wasn't worth it at the time, said Hook. I'll never forget what that guy did to me that day. But it's funny how things come full circle if a man will wait long enough. Well, you got that right, said Lewis. Lewis.